Our next guest is an author, international public speaker, and native-born Israeli. As the president and founder of Behold Israel Ministry, he travels the world teaching on Bible prophecy in light of current events. Please welcome to the stage, Amir Sarfati. All right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, please. While we're standing, let us all give a great shout out to Riverside Calvary Chapel in Langley, British Columbia. The, the whole church is sitting right now watching this conference. Beautiful. Good. So, please sit down. Uh, this afternoon, I would like to uh, talk about our generation. A great generation, a blessed generation, a generation that is seeing things that no other generation has seen since the time of Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years ago, the generation of that time felt almost the same. It was a Galilean Jew named Peter who actually said, these words about the salvation that he had experienced. But before we read his words, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word is truth. And we ask you now to sanctify us by that truth, your truth. We want to hear from you today. And we ask that in the name of the word of God, the Son of God, the name above all names. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, 2,000 years ago, a Galilean Jew felt that he is part of an amazing generation. Probably the greatest generation of that time. And he wrote about the salvation that he himself experienced, the following thing. He said, of this salvation... The prophets have inquired and searched carefully. Who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It's amazing. You know, if you really think about it, Peter understood that he is part of the greatest generation since the beginning of the world. Why? Because he realized all throughout the Old Testament, there were those people to whom God revealed the truth of the Messiah, the truth of the grace of God, the truth of the Son of God, the truth of the salvation that can only come through Him, but they could not see it. They searched and they asked and they wondered, when will that happen? And Peter said, it happened in my lifetime. Peter said that, and not only that, in the same uh, portion of scriptures, when he actually uh, talked about it, he said the following thing. He said, the, he, he said also, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Peter said, wow, we're part of a generation that received that which the prophets were searching and the angels wished they knew. And here we are. And 2,000 years later, I'm submitting right now here this afternoon to all of you that we live in the greatest generation. Yes. And what makes a generation great? 
Um, I think it was Tom Brokaw that, that, that wrote the book entitled The Greatest Generation. Of course, that was the era of those who experienced the Great Depression and fought in World War II that became known as The Greatest Generation. And of course, we know that they were called that way for what they themselves did. And in the eyes of many Americans, that generation is credited with the freedoms that are experienced by the generations that would follow even today. That's why they're called that way. But in reality, scripturally, the Bible says the generations were always often noted for their faithfulness or lack thereof in response to God's revealed will at that specific time in history. So, for example, Moses, in response to the Israelites in the wilderness in Deuteronomy 32, verse 5, they have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because of their blemish, a perverse and crooked generation. Speaking of a generation that has seen the work of God yet did not believe. Joshua's generation also was described in Joshua in Judges chapter 2. It says, Now Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnat Heres, in the mountains of Ephraim, on the north side of Mount Gash, where all that gener when all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, Another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. So the question is, do we know and are, do we acknowledge the work that God has been doing in our midst ever since we got saved? Even Jesus in his lifetime saw religious leaders and called the Pharisees of that time a, uh, you know, talking about wicked and adulterous generations seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. So I'm saying to you all this afternoon, this is the greatest generation, because not only that we have the amazing salvation that was promised by the prophets of the Old Testament. But we have much more than that. We are seeing unbelievable things that no other generation has seen before. Now why do I make that claim that we are the greatest generation when we see that all around us today there's an increase of ungodliness and the world decaying in a very extremely fast way? I'm saying that because we as the greatest generation have the greatest proof. The generation has witnessed some of the most undeniable proof concerning the fulfillment of Bible prophecy through current events. And I will tell you that when Friedrich the Great, who was the king of Prussia between 1740 and 1772, once asked his physicians, his physician for the single most irrefutable proof of God's existence. His physician's response was, Your Majesty, the continued existence of the Jews is the proof that God exists. But that's not enough. Because we are not just a generation that is watching the, continu the continuation of the existence of, it, of the Jewish people. We are the generation that is seeing the nation of Israel in a way that no other generation before us could experience. You see, in the 1800s, the late 1800s, the first wave of Jewish pioneers made it to the land of Israel. At the time, it was still called Palestine because of Caesar Adrian in 135 that named it after the Philistines in order to humiliate the Jewish rebels at that time. And then when we return to the land, I want you to see what the land looked like 
It was a barren wasteland. Mark Twain, by the way, was there, and he wrote in his journal that it was such a barren wasteland that even the cactus, which is a great friend of the desert, did not want to grow there. <laughs> by the way, he also saw that throughout his entire journey, he saw not even a single living soul. And that's for all those who say that the Arabs were there first. He didn't see them. Now, Ezekiel, in chapter 36, said something very interesting. Ezekiel, in the beautiful three chapters of 36 and 37, and again then 38, he begins with the amazing things that we as a generation that I call the greatest are able to see even today. Look what he said. He said, therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel. Remember, I showed you a picture of the land of Israel. Prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys, Thus says the Lord God, behold, I have spoken in my jealousy, in my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. What does it mean you have borne the shame of the nations? Because of your unfaithfulness, the children of Israel... I took you out of the land, and you, being away from your land, actually caused the nations to ridicule you and caused the land to be, look, dead. And he said, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. But then look what he says. But you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. God says, it is a dead land, but I'm about to do something. And I'm about to speak life into this dead land. And take a look at what the land looks like right now. Pretty different, isn't it? We are exporting fruits and vegetables to the whole world. We are actually using, we reclaim water. 80% of our wastewater are now being reclaimed. I mean, I was in a farm and I saw a beautiful pool with clear water. And I looked and, and they asked me, guess how deep it is? I said, what, three feet? They said, 30. I said, whoa, they said, you can taste the water. I tasted it, I said, they're very good. And they said, well, we just uh, flushed the water from the bathroom. And, <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, how does it go here? And, well, apparently, not only that we're good in, you know, desalinization and all of that, we are actually able today with water plants to clean wastewater all the way to the point that we can actually drink it. And then she said, do you want to drink more? I said, no, 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 I'm not thirsty anymore. <laughs> And not only that, the, the land was commanded to come back to life. Then Ezekiel was brought to a valley full of dry bones. And the Lord said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Now I'm not talking about the, the land. He's talking about the people that are away from the land. And he says, they, they indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. The nation of Israel being away from the land of Israel was sure that the God of Israel forgot about Israel. And the Lord says, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, first of all, behold, O oh my people, you're still my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves. And I will bring you into the land of Israel, not Palestine. I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O oh my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you where? In your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, not only spoke it, I have spoken it and performed it, said the Lord. 
God said, look, I'm going to do an amazing thing. First, I'm going to speak life to the dead country. Then I'm going to open the graves. I will liberate all those death camps in Europe. And I will bring my people from there. And look, look at those photos. There is no hope in these eyes. They are sure that they have been cut off. They think that God forgot all about them. But God says, that's not it. My grandparents survived the death camps in Poland. They made it eventually to a port in Italy where they boarded a boat that was stopped by the British police off the shores of the land of Israel. And they turned that boat to the island of Cyprus to a detention camp where my mother was born. And if that's not enough, God did not stop only there. This is right after the Holocaust, 1945, 46, 47. In November of 1947, a great thing happened. And out there in the Judean wilderness, a Bedouin Muslim shepherd threw a rock into a cave, thinking that his lost goat will probably come out of that uh, cave. Well, instead of a bah, he found a sound. He actually heard the sound of a broken jar. He crawled in and take a look at what he found. He found scrolls written mostly on animal skin. One of them was the entire book of the prophet Isaiah. Written 2200 years ago as a copy of something that was there to be copied from. And in that 2200 year old scroll, I will never forget it. It was the 60th anniversary of Israel. I go with my Bible, the book of Isaiah. I enter the Israel Museum. They just put it on display. I look at Isaiah, I look at Isaiah, I look at Isaiah. I, look. I was shocked. It's the same. And then I walked out and I was shocked that I was shocked. Because <laughs> if the Bible is the same, why should I be shocked that my Bible and that Bible is the same? And I was not shocked that I was shocked that I was shocked. Don't worry. <laughs> but, I, but Isaiah chapter 66. Who has heard such a thing? Say who. Who, who has seen such things? Who? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth. To her children. Make no mistake, Zion is the name of the land. And when the Jewish people believe that their land is the land of Israel, they are Zionist. When a Christian believes that the land belongs to the Jewish people, he is a Zionist. Zionist Zionism is not a bad word. The enemy wants you to think it's a bad word. Then, of course, 1948, May 14, in the Palestine Post, which is the Jerusalem Post today, it says, the state of what? <laughs> what you're watching is Isaiah 66 being fulfilled. The land was called Palestine by the enemies. The name that was given to the land, to the state is? Israel. Isaiah was right. A nation was born within a day. Boom. It was so fast that the British decided to leave and we declared statehood that we didn't even have time to write our Declaration of Independence on one piece of paper. We actually wrote it on different pieces and then sewed it together. There was no time. It was Friday afternoon before Shabbat. We had to go to the Israel, to the Tel Aviv Museum, and David Ben-Gurion stood there and declared, I hereby declare the establishment of the state of the Jews, which will be called the state of Israel. Amen. And the first country in the world that recognizes it, the United States. Amen. And the minute he did that, the great immigration started all the way by sea, by land, by air. Jewish, for every person that lived in Israel, four new immigrants made it. To the land. I mean, imagine a billion people coming to America within a couple of years. Well, maybe you shouldn't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
they be automatically became uh, citizens. Well, okay, now, <laughs> how do you even communicate when you have Jews from over 120 nations? Well, how is a German Jew going to talk to a Moroccan Jew about anything? Well, if at the same time that God restored the land and restored the people back to their land, he also restored the language. And Eliezer ben Yehuda, after which ben Yehuda street is named, <laughs> is the one, the prophetic revival of the Hebrew language after so many years. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they, have make, they all may call on the name of the Lord. The only way all of Israel can call on the name of the Lord together as one is if they speak the same language. To serve Him with one accord. I don't know if you know this, but an Israeli born Jew is speaking to you today. Now, you probably say, well, of course, I know it. Well, this is unthinkable for anyone who was born before 1948 or even earlier. My grandparents, when they grew up, never in their wildest dream thought that their grandchild will be born in Jerusalem in the independent state of Israel. With Jerusalem as its capital. We take it for granted. We don't understand. This is something that the Jews have been waiting for for 2,000 years. And our people, our generation today is just, oh yeah, there's Israel. Yeah, nice. <laughs> In the University of Berkeley, you call it? There are nutcases over there. You know that. <laughs> they just declared safe zones from Free of Israelis. No, I'm not joking. Pastor Jack, where are you? Am I right? I'm right. I know I'm right. <laughs> so you have in that university Israeli free zone. Yep. And today, our generation, look at all of us. We have seen the magnificent move from a country that was on the verge of annihilation upon its birth to a country that is safe, secure, and very prosperous. Ezekiel 36, for indeed I am for you and I will turn to you and you shall be tilled and sown. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the cities shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you men and beasts and they shall increase and bear young. And bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times. Ezekiel, in those days, is talking about the future days. And he says the future days will be like in the old days. A world superpower in energy, in military, in technology, in, in, in whatever you I think about it. Israel is leading in so many parameters. Where we have made an amazing swing from the times that our neighbors wanted to destroy us, and I'm talking about Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, and, and, and Jordan in Psalm 83, to all the way to Ezekiel 38, where Arab countries wants to have peace with us right now. Sign, look, I don't know if you could see, this is an amazing photo. Why? Yeah. Not because of um, the 45th necessarily. But it's because of the fact that when there was someone that was in charge in the White House, and when he crushed the head of the snake when he had to, peace came to the Middle East. But when someone is sleeping while standing and appeasing his enemies and talking to them while they're killing his own people, then you get war in the Middle East. And we are in the eve of a war in the Middle East. Psalm 83 spoke of the immediate nations that are surrounding Israel. And that was in 1948. Every word of that psalm has been fulfilled because it was a spirit of let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. We just declared the name of Israel and they wanted to destroy it. 
And that was Jordan and Egypt and, and Syria and Lebanon and even Iraq. And it says that Assyria came to help them. But I want to tell you, folks, today it's different. Today, Jordan and Egypt actually depend on Israel. We're selling them gas. Without our gas, they cannot survive. And Syria practically ceased to exist. And Lebanon is in a chaos. Ezekiel 38 says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tuval, and prophesy against him. Say, Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I am what? Against you. So many Christians are rooting now for Putin as the savior of the world. As if he is the, the bearer of the moral flag. <laughs> God says, I'm against you, mister. You can say whatever you want. I judge you by your actions. The prince of Rosh. I will turn you around. And he will bring Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya all together to come against us. Mostly from the north. A coalition of countries is being formed before our very eyes. And you all can see that. We've never seen that before. Turkey and Russia and Iran are now aligned together. Sudan and Libya will join them as they are unstable countries waiting and being under the mercies of these three. And we are going to see that very soon. But remember, we are the fig tree generation. That's what makes us so great. When Jesus gave the famous Olivet Discourse, he says, learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at your doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Amen. And we are the generation that not only see the fig tree coming back to life, Israel is likened to be the fig tree. The national privilege of Israel is the fig tree. The religious and the spiritual are the olive and the vine. And you have been grafted into those two because you share those, but you're not sharing the national privileges. Israel is not your country. Jerusalem is not your capital. And the Israeli passport is not your passport. That's for them. But for you, it is to see the fig tree coming back to life. Not to be part of the fig tree, but to see the fig tree. All of you, you live in the greatest generation since the time of Jesus Christ. We see the rise of globalism. By the way, globalism is not new. Not only that it goes back to the Tower of Babel, but even in our lifetime... Paul Henry Spock, the first president of the United Nations General Assembly and, a first, and the prime minister of Belgium and one of the early planners of the European community market and the secretary general of NATO said, look what he said, we do not want another committee. We have too many already. We, what we want is a man of sufficient stature to hold the allegiance of all people and to lift us up out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, and whether he be God or devil, we will receive him. <laughs> what about David Rockefeller, who died in 2017? He wrote in his memoir the following thing, page four or five. He says, some even believe we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic uh, structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty. And I am proud of it. He, he said that. 
It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. He says, we had to be under the ground for many years, he said. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. This, the, super, the supernational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national order determination practiced in past centuries. Wow. Congressman Larry McDonald, who was killed in 1983 in an in a airline crash, or Korean Airlines, shot down actually by the Soviets. He said, and probably that's why the airline was shut down, he said, the drive of the Rockefellers and their allies is to create a one world government combining super capitalism and communism under the same tent. All under their control. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I am convinced there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning, and incredibly evil in intent. And after he said that, his plane was shot down. Arnold Toynbee, the British historian and philosopher of history who died in 1975, wrote, The nations are ready to give the kingdom of the world to anyone, any one man who will offer us a solution to our world's problems. So you see, it didn't start with the World Economic Forum. It goes back decades and it will continue. It's a slow process, but what we already see, and we've talked about it ever since last night throughout almost all the messages this morning, is that there is a redefining of family, there is a sexual identity crisis, and there is a rise of in Satanism in plain sight. Look what we see. Air Force Academy diversity training tells cadets to use words that includes all genders and drop mom and dad. It's no longer just in, out there. In the, you know, look, I received a push notification yesterday. Virgin Atlantic Airlines is now saying, did you see that on my telegram? Are you on my telegram channel? <laughs> Male pilots are now allowed to board the plane dressed with a skirt. No. I'm going to have to check the cockpit before I'm, I'm boarding the plane from now on. <laughs> Sexual identity crisis, tons of flags, tons of ideas everywhere. The rise of Satanism is all around us. Neo-paganism, Satanism, it's just everywhere. And I'll tell you soon why. Second Thessalonians says that the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. You see, the Antichrist is not someone who is driven by God, who has any allegiance to God. He is coming according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, lying wonders. There will be unbelievable things happening. Look, we must be out of here for him to be revealed. And I believe that once we're out of here, the only way for the world to not even talk about our disappearance is be, there will be some unbelievable wonders and signs in the heavenlies. All around. The Bible says that he will come with deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Only delusional people can, can go on with their life without addressing the question of where did those millions disappear to? You have to be delusional. And by the way, we're not going to fly like Mary Poppins just upwards. <laughs> we'll just boom, disappear. And, and, and they might report that in the news and then the next, okay, Britney Spears divorced again. They, they will move on. <laughs> so we are seeing indicators to the last days and the soon return of Christ. And, and it supports the validity, authenticity, and reliability of scriptures. But let me tell you, we are also the greatest generation that will see and experience the greatest challenge. And you probably... Think, oh, which, oh, there's so many challenges. Well, there is one big one. And you know what it is? It's technology. 
Without question, the generation faces a host of challenges, especially amidst the rise of social media. This generation is, this is the generation that is getting more information quicker than any other generation in, since the time of Jesus. Everything, anything we want, we can, boom, immediately, Dr. Google. <laughs> but the problem, look at what Insider wrote. The problem is humans can't keep up with all the technology they have created. You know that so many people commit suicide because they cannot keep up? Yes, they feel like they cannot keep up with the world. Now in Daniel chapter 12, when he describes the end time, he says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. And look what he says. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. To and fro. What are we talking about here? Let me tell you, the Old Testament has many other uh, examples to that. Jeremiah chapter 5. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places if you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Run, look, seek. Amos 8, 12, they shall wander from the sea, from sea to sea, and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. By the way, in the Hebrew, do you want to know the Hebrew words? Yes. Let's put the Hebrew. Yeshotetu <laughs> Rabim. The word Yeshotetu in the Hebrew means to walk without doing anything or without purpose. Like zombies, walking all around. In Israel, by the way, if this is done in a suspicious fashion, if somebody's walking like that in a suspicious fashion, and the police can arrest him. And they can actually lock him up up until six months. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> many will just wander around without any purpose. Knowledge will increase. There will be more. Look, the, the one, on one hand, we have access to information more than ever before. Chiefly, the completed Word of God, by the way. <laughs> Anyone can have a Bible online today. Yet people are more confused and lost than ever. Technology provides access to information. But know that not all that information is helpful. Look, if you sit in your house and watch YouTube all day long, you will end up losing your mind. <laughs> the greatest challenge is living in a world full of technology and information, yet still focusing on the things that matters. You have a purpose and a mission. Ephesians chapter 5, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. How many hours do you spend in front of your computers, in front of your phones? What is the purpose of this? How much of these hours, how many of these hours are actually for purpose, for, for, for something good? Colossians 3, if then you were raised with Christ, then seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. Not on the Kardashians. <laughs> For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's not choose the path of sensationalism, clickbaits, means sarcasm, ridiculing, and all of that. You know how many Christians spend time ridiculing others? I myself, you know how many memes were done about me? Oh yes, because Christians have time to make memes. Because they have a lot of time. Because it's very fruitful. It leads so many to the Lord. We have become so bitter, angry, confused, embarrassed. 
when actually we have access to the greatest information. We have the technology that can give us even better way to share the gospel than ever before. And what are we doing with our time? You see, it's a challenge. Technology is there. But people are walking to and fro when knowledge is indeed increasing. Our generation, the greatest generation, not only has a great proof and a great challenge, but also great opposition. This generation faces opposition in just about every direction. You're dealing with opposition on so many various fronts. Because the God of this world has blinded the people of this world. And as a result, even government, society, and the world that is all around us standing in opposition as we seek to fulfill the Lord's calling upon our lives. Think about it. Government used to protect you from evil. The government is now facilitating evil. It used to be about protecting the life at all costs. Now, it's everything about ending innocent life. Lifestyle trumps life. People want to maintain their lifestyle by ending someone else's life. Take a look at someone who is running for governor office. She says, there is no such thing as six-week fetal heartbeat. It's manufactured sound. She said, men are doing that to control women's bodies. What are we doing? Sitting there and doing, uh, doing what exactly? We are not that capable of doing sounds. Come on. Isaiah 5, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who call darkness, for, uh, put darkness for light and light for darkness. Who put bitter to sweet and sweet for bitter. America, a country that was founded by the idea that there must be freedom to worship. Amazing. Is now looking at the freedom to worship as a problem. Not the solution. Church is no longer held essential. Your amazing governor said when he was asked, why can't churches open? His response it was this, because churches are high risk and low reward. Apparently, he doesn't know what the church is all about because we, of course, are essential. High risk, low reward? While bars and sex shops and, 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 and drug dealers could do business for free because it's low risk, high reward. <laughs> the greatest opposition involves also standing for biblical truths in a world that is more into virtual reality. Extreme individualism. The departure from God's created order, gender. Pronouns. People call themselves we. <laughs> the last time I read about someone who called himself we to describe himself was the demon possessed man. <laughs> In the land of the Gadareans. We because we are legion because we are many. Remember? <laughs> Ephesians 4.1 Therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of calling with which you were called. In John 17, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not. Of the world, but we are in the world and we pray that He will always protect us from the evil one. <laughs> Proverbs 28 The wicked flee when no one pursues, uh, 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 pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Amen. Are you bold? Yes. The greatest opposition is also experienced by those who seek to walk with God in this decaying world. And you will always have opposition. Number four, 
the greatest deception. All of the speakers talked about it. That was quite amazing. The Spirit of God just, just managed to craft this whole thing. Matthew 24. Now, as he sat on Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. The end times will be mostly characterized by deception. And not just deception from the outside, but from the inside. Imposters, fake news, everything is all around us. But the greatest deception is coming from within the church. Prophecy, by the way, is one of the most vulnerable topics when it comes to deception. Everyone is... is, is, is Abusing that word. I have a prophetic word. Prophetic update. Prophetic this. Prophetic that. No wonder why people don't want to hear about prophecy anymore. It's being abused and being filled with trash and conspiracy theories. Wasting time on stupid things. Sorry I have to say that in French. <laughs> Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. 2 Timothy 3.13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Peter 2.1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 21, Test all things and hold fast what is good. The church has never been so irrelevant as today when we look at the church around us. Pulpits have never been so silent about the end times. Christians have never been so unprepared for challenges. Pastors have never been so afraid of tackling controversial topics. Traditional church has become a key player in promoting climate change alarming, LGBTQ acceptance, canceling borders, making nationality irrelevant, and so on. When Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. That's what the word of God says. But not what pastors are saying from the pulpit. Genesis 5.2 He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. It is biblical. Genesis 8.22 While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat. Winter and summer, cold and heat, there will be decades of cooler and decades of hotter. In the 70s, they thought that the whole world is going to freeze. Now we're all melting, schwitzing in Yiddish. <laughs> Acts 17, he has made, uh, ma made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. God made the boundaries of the dwellings of the nations. See, all of these are very simple in the Bible. The Bible is so clear and accurate about these things. And I'll go all the way to tell you that we live in a world that has deceived itself into thinking that it can produce the answers to all its problems. When you leave Christ out of the formula, you're actually neglecting the only solution. Galatians 3 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, talking about race, neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. But I will conclude with this point. The greatest generation not only has the greatest proof and the greatest challenge and the greatest deception, but also the greatest hope. <laughs> you see, let me tell you something. No, wait, listen, no, don't waste your time. <laughs> I know too many people that are walking in this world, calling themselves Christians, but they're sad and they're angry. I know them because they write me. <laughs> they're telling me what they think about me. And they're angry. They're mean. 
I remember the two disciples that left on Sunday morning Jerusalem after the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection. And they walked to the village called Emmaus. And the Bible says that they were talking to one another. And Jesus appeared and said, what kind of conversation is that you have with one another as you walk and you are sad? Jesus is asking his own disciples after he resurrected from the dead, why are you so sad? What are those things that you converse? And one of them called Cleophas answered and says, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem with an attitude of a Jew? And have you not known the things that happened in these, last, in these days? And Jesus answered, what things? <laughs> what things can cause you to be sad today? What things can cause you to be angry today when I am alive and I'm walking with you? What happened to you that you ran away from Jerusalem where I told you to wait? And they're going all the way to a village, confused, angry, disappointed, embarrassed and I'm here I'm alive and you know that I'm alive because you're about to tell me the story of how the women went to the grave and found it empty they told him the whole story about his resurrection <laughs> and he's like wow that's what happened wow okay and then they are like yes these are the things and he looked at them and he said oh foolish ones and slow of heart to believe that's which the prophets have said. See, that's what prophecies are. Well, I'm so excited about Bible prophecy because it causes us to be excited about the Lord's resurrection and his, his soon return to take us. Why are we sad? Why are we not excited? I don't understand that. While the generation of World War II is admirable in many ways and undoubtedly saved people physically and exemplify the idea of counting others' lives as more important than one's own, the mission of the Christian is to reconcile people to God and saving people spiritually. So I'm asking you, what kind of a generation are you going to be? See, we are the greatest generation. There is no doubt about it. We are the generation that can see the fig tree blooming. We are the generation that can see the land of Israel, the people of Israel, the enemies of Israel. We are the generation that can see all the stage for the Antichrist ready, all the stage for Ezekiel war to come to pass, all the stage for a third temple to be built right after that, all the stage for the technology and the satanic brainwashing of the world. But we, we are different. We are not of this world. All of us, the Bible says in Philippians, to do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of the crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. The greatest hope is Jesus Christ. And you will never be able to communicate the gospel with fear and anxiety, but with power, with love, and with sound mind, and not with conspiracy theories. <laughs> Laughing and mocking and sensationalizing and wasting time on idle things, all of which will fail to be a good witness. The greatest hope is Jesus Christ, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power and love and of sound mind. These things, Jesus said, I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. And allow me to ask you to stand up and to read together with me the following verse from Revelation 22. Let's read it together. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.